Hello, everyone. This is the Urbonus podcast. I'm the host, Donato Surbonus, and I'm honored to present you Eric McCollum and Mike James on my podcast as the Urbonus co hosts tonight. So, hello, gentlemen. Happy to be here. What's going on? So, Eric is still happy to be in Ohio to enjoy his last days before Kashiaka's training camp. I'm still in Vilnius, enjoying my last week at home before taking off to the Philippines for the World Cup. And Mike is currently in Monaco, right? Still yeah. in Monaco. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> and you're going to training camp in Bormio tomorrow or this weekend, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So l- let's put the elephant out of the room, okay? Mike, what wh- what's going on out there? What's going on out there with all these rumors that you want to leave Monaco, that you might have agreed with Olympiagas and all this stuff? Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't agree with nobody, but I had some uh, some questions about okay. my uh, future here. They didn't really get answered, but that's all right. Well, I guess they did get into kind of. Okay. So, so you kind of I I tried to type Mike James on Twitter, and these are uh-huh. the first tweets that I get on my feed. So, okay. Mike James has reached an agreement for Olympiacos, denied already by Mike. The second thing, the club has informed Mike James' side that he is considered a cornerstone of the team and no talks about the possible release were made. The, the third one, Mike James wants to play for Olympiacos. American point guard has agreed to lower his salary to help the Greek club release him from Monaco. So can you help us out to find out what's true, what's false, what the real situation is? What were all of them again? Which one I need to answer? <laughs> Third one was you're going to take discount on your services. Second one. That's not happening. The first time I saw that, I was like, there's no chance he's taking discounts. That has to be false. Hey, man. Hey, man. I don't, I don't know, though. I don't know what the rumors is. I don't know what's going on. But uh, I think I was, number two uh, makes sense because you're there now. So you must be part of the plans long term, at least for this foreseeable season. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm cornerstone or part of the plans or none of that, but you know, I was told I was staying, so I'm here. I don't know about mm-hmm. the other parts of the tweet. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that. And w- what do you mean by saying you were told that you were staying? Did you have any communication with the club or your agent was talking with the club? Uh. I don't know about complications. I had questions. They didn't really get answered. Still have it. And, you know, I was weighing my options. Mm. And w- w- what's the main question that you have for the club? The unanswered question yet? Uh, just about me and the future and what's going on and things pertaining to that. If I have a future here. And I think... Uh, if I didn't have a future going forward past this year, it wasn't really no point in me being here for this year. Mm. So you wanted an extension just to show like where they were with you? Not really an extension, but just like some type of communication on what is going forward and what's going on. And uh, I didn't really get that. Well, that I didn't really get any answer really, just that I'm staying here for this year. Or I'm, or I'm not allowed to leave, or I'm not allowed to explore anything. Whatever the verbiage is, the right verbiage right there. Yeah, because just to make clear, you're under the contract with Monaco for one last season, right? For 23-24 season. Yeah, that's the season. Yeah, this is my last year on contract. Mm, okay, and you know, I followed your Twitter feed and between June and July, it was like you greeting newcomers to the team, then you posting this picture of you, Ellie, and Jordan uh, and about 
you know, being locked in for the next season, also about Dante Hall staying uh, after all these rumors. And for me, it felt like the narrative has changed when Kemba Walker was signed. So did you have these questions after this uh, about your future after this signing? Was it the, let's say, um, you know, the, the main thing that hit your, uh, let's say, hit you regarding your future in the club? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think like that signing like made me like say like, oh, my future is bad. I think I, it's really interesting just because I don't really know. It was hard working with three guards last year with four. It seems almost impossible, but I guess we're going to figure it out. But uh, yeah, not really that signing. I think uh, that's a lot of traffic. I don't really know. Uh, yeah, I don't know how that's going to, I don't know what's going to happen, to be honest, or how it's going to work. I guess it's going to be an interesting dynamic to figure out. And, uh, you know, happy he's here, happy he can help, if he can help, and if he likes it and all that stuff. Because we know that's like a different uh, type of game and all that, and getting adjusted to being over here. But, uh, you know, whatever it takes to win. I was going to say, just basically, it's always difficult um, when you have a lot of talent, a lot of good players, and it's really hard to see how it all fits. Um, I think what makes it tougher is just not knowing how Kimba will play in Europe. You know, we've seen him in NBA. We've seen him, you know, different roles in that manner. And so when you put it all together, you know, I can see an explosive backcourt, but I think questions are, you know, maybe Mike hasn't said it. Maybe I'm over speaking for him, but like, as what I would want to know is how it will be used. Will I be on ball? Will I be off ball? Will he be on ball? Will he be off ball? Uh, will our minutes be staggered? Will we be playing together most of the time? What's that mean for Ellie? You know, Jordan, like, how's that going to go? Are we going to go three guard front a lot? What's that mean for the three man, um, you know, in those positions? So just to kind of get an idea of, you know, how I need to work out, how I need to train. Do I need to do more catch and shoot this summer? Do I need to do more? Um, close out attacks, coming off screens, pin downs, like just to get an idea. So a lot of people probably are wondering, you know, why does that matter? Why is it important? Your job is to play, but how we train, how we prepare um, is extremely important when putting ourselves in the best situation and sees it. So maybe this is some questions that Mike might have had and you know, that could have easily been answered and allowed him to come in fully prepared for training camp in the season. That would have helped. <laughs> so you didn't have any of those conversations with Coach Obradovic? I mean, uh, I've had a lot of conversations with Coach. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, Coach does a lot of the signings over here. So I don't know, I don't know if that was his call or not. I don't, I don't think it was. So I don't think, uh, you know, I think he probably gonna have to go into the season figuring it out too. I think we played a lot of three guards last year and I, and somehow I always end up guarding the three somehow. And, you know, I didn't, it was cool to do, but I didn't really want to do a lot more of it. It's, it's, it's a lot to be battling with threes. I'm not the biggest person in the world. Will you know, enjoyed gotta, these matchups. I remember that Will really enjoyed these matchups. Yeah, I got to guard Will. I got to guard his own. Yeah, I got to guard these people at 6'8". I am. This is all this is all fluff at this point. I'm just, you know, trying to be strong and swipe and hopefully I get a piece of the ball. Like So, you know, and we add somebody like that who uh, you know, rightfully so deserves to play and deserves to, you know, have a role on the team that probably me leaves me guarding the three a lot again. So you know, just uh stuff like that that uh isn't the you know This is not something I want to do. It's something I, I can do in spurts and, you know, am willing to do. But do I really want to do that for a long period of time and, you know, have to guard people outside of my position just because of our roster, basically? Because we have four guards that need to play and we're all six, two and under. So I, I just wonder how much... Kemba Walker Walker is really going to play with his knees, with his injury history. Is he able to play more than 20 minutes 
in an in intensive yearly game i mean i think that these these questions will be addressed and before the season maybe in the preseason to check on his availability also from what i know jordan is injured right and he's about to miss the whole preparation for the season and i'm not sure when he's returning is he going to be ready for the opener of the yearly season so i don't know maybe you know it won't be that bad you know with the traffic or to, to solve this whole traffic in, in the backcourt if there are any concerns over Kemba's health and Jordan's situation looking at long term because he was also in and out during the last season right so I don't know yeah uh, uh, it seems hypocritical but I also don't want to go through a preseason by myself and it kind of seems like that that's what we get into at this point Jordan's out Ellie's not here we don't oh, know yeah. You know, what Kemba status is. So basically, I'm 33 years old going through preseason by myself. So that means I got to play yeah, six it. preseason games. Does that mean I got to play 30 minutes. minutes in the preseason too? That's, that's, I'm a little old to Maybe be playing Strazel. 30 minutes in preseason. Maybe Strazel can help you a little bit, get the young boy some minutes, let him get his feet wet. But you're going to play some preseason, it seems like, with all those guys missing. We don't got no twos either. Yak is gone. Ellie's not here. Jordan's not here. So who's going to play? Okay. <laughs> That's also on the list of your questions that you have. I got a lot of questions, man, that it wasn't answered. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's tough. It's not easy. Well, it's not what's easy the main, to communicate. What's the main difference between the last offseason and this offseason? Because when Ellie joined Monaco, we also had a lot of questions. And I remember that you also had questions about this move, but somehow you figured it out. I mean, you made it Final Four. You were two wins away from the title. So what was the main difference? How do you, did you guys solve that situation out? I think for spurts of the season, it was real touch and go. I think it took us a while to figure it out. I think it didn't really get figured out all the way until like March. Honestly, because I think Jordan got hurt a couple times. So then it was just me and Ellie. And then I was out. So it's just Ellie and Jordan. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like we didn't really get to figure it all the way out until late in the season. That's when you kind of seen us figure out each other's spots and where we like the ball, what quarters we play better in, how we like plays ran for us and things like that to where all three of us can pick the, bring the ball up. And we knew exactly what each player liked to do and things of that nature. So I think uh, just getting that rhythm down was hard enough in the season. We have three people who are that talented and need to play and need the ball. So then adding a fourth person who on paper probably is the most talented if that's, you know what I'm saying? If he comes in healthy and he's ready. So, uh, I mean, he was like a four-time All-Star. So uh, trying to figure that a whole another dynamic in and we already figured that out uh, sounds challenging and uh, Sounds difficult, and I got a lot of questions. Yeah, I think um, from the outside looking in, the difference is we've seen how Ellie looks in the European system, Jordan, Mike. We've seen them all. Even though it was different teams, we've seen them play different type of roles. I think the biggest question is we haven't seen what Kimba looks like, and then people aren't sure. Are we getting you know a healthy Kimba? Are we getting uh, Kimba towards the end? You know, I'm not sure. I think that will be seen, and I think that's what raises the questions. And then. It's not just a regular player. It's a player, you know, as Mike said, a four-time all-star guy who was getting max money. So that's a guy who usually is going to demand the ball. It's a guy who's not going to come in and go to the corner. And so you have two guys who are really good with the basketball and Kimba and Mike. And it could be a great weapon um, if they can find that time to mesh. But depending on the preseason, depending on the health, depending on how many minutes these guys are getting together, you know, you never know how things could go. It could be beautiful. Or it could be uh, catastrophic. It just, <laughs> it just remains to be seen. But I do think um, it's something that could be exciting. Um, I don't like that. I don't. It's not. I like Kimba's talent. I don't like the signing only because they made it to the final four with what they had. I thought maybe if they got some more shooting at the four position or at the five position, you know, I thought that would have been sufficient and that would have created more space. I felt like they had the ball handlers, the creators. You know, obviously you get a player like Kimba. It's hard to say no. He's extremely talented. Um, He's going to sell tickets. He's a big name. Um, he raises the profile of the Euro League. It's hard to say no to that. But you were one game away from the final. 
And so for me, I don't like to make drastic changes. I would have liked them to go with a taller guard profile, something like a, a Dante Exum or something, if they want it, you know, to go that route. If you wanted another guard, another playmaker, just someone who can guard multiple positions, who has that size and gives them flexibility offensively and defensively. But, you know, I know there's not a lot of Exums out there and not a lot of tall guards available. It's just a different way, a different approach, I think, going with um, shorter guards, um, when you already had those questions last year. Yeah, and when Monaco was after Mirotic, it really made a lot of sense. You know, they b went mm -hmm. for a, the best stretch four option that you can get in the EuroLeague market. And by the way, Mike, is that true that the whole recruiting process, uh, Monaco's recruiting campaign basically also started from you? Because from what I understood, you're in a good connection with Nicola. I remember the way you stood up for him after his Final Four experience, which was tough. This His semifinal game against Real Madrid was really bad, but you kind of stood up. And I heard that you might also, you've been involved in this whole process, maybe just texting him or asking if you could join us, if you would join us, if we could make a good fit over there in Monaco. Was, was that true? Did you try to get involved at least a little bit or just to check what he thinks of it? Uh, I've been involved in like five people's recruiting process actually, okay. but, uh, yeah, Nico's, uh, we played together in, in New Orleans, so I've known him for a little while and, uh, you know, we two, uh, we two of the like, uh, you know, more high profile players to play in the year league ever that haven't won. I think I seen an article last year that said we probably the two best that haven't won. So, uh, I think after we both had a a final four that was not what we wanted. I think we kind of had a conversation and talked about playing it with each other, no matter uh, where the destination was. And obviously he was having problems in Barcelona and they were having problems. So uh, the easiest answer was Monaco. So uh, I tried to connect the dots there and try to, you know, facilitate uh, him going somewhere. Obviously I'm not in the uh, GM room or the, uh, owner's room or the coach's room so it's you know i just can only talk a little bit and i can't do numbers i can't promise things i can't do none of that all i can do is uh just tell them goods and bads and tell them i want to play with them and hopefully it'll work out but uh obviously he didn't choose us and go with us he had a you know a lot going on and uh he was as friends we were very he was very open with me the whole time about what he was going to do and uh you know I was trying not to bother him too much because, you know, you kind of don't want to bother somebody when they're making a big decision like that. But I, I reached out a lot almost every other day just to talk and see what he was doing and see what he was thinking and see where he was leaning. So uh, it wasn't really a surprise to me when he kind of was leaning towards a uh, partisan and then whatever happened with that. And then I kind of knew he was going to Milan. So uh, just uh, – talking to him every day, trying to get him to come here. You know, it's always great to play with great players and good players. You know, you always want talent around you that you think can help and you think they can get you to the next level, especially when you're uh, about winning. So, uh, you know, it would have been great to have him. We didn't get him and, uh, you know, moving forward. Mm. What do you think Monaco was missing, except from numbers, if we, ex we exclude that part? Maybe he was... Monaco was lacking of something else because obviously he 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 chose first it was part partisan then it was Milan let's say the the organization with more experience with with a bigger history and stuff M maybe that was you know an issue for him regarding Monaco's uh, bid uh the way i understand it was it was partisan and then us and then he chose mm -hmm. partisan and we moved on and made some signings and then when the partisan thing happened what happened uh milan was just kind of the last team standing that's the way i understand it but i could be incorrect but um i think uh you know he has a house in serbia i think his wife was comfortable there before uh some things went down and uh you know can't argue with wife if he'd have said you know his kids was comfortable there i'd have told him hey man we can get him in a good place in monaco we'll figure it out but, uh, you know, I think his wife is comfortable there. He, he, I think he has a house there in the summer. I think he told me. And it's Coach Obradovich. So, I mean, I can't really argue with uh, none of those factors, really. Uh, you know, all I could do is kind of put my bid in and tell him that, uh, you know, 
I get you open. You'll be open with me. You get more open shots than you think you will. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm happy for him if he's happy. And I'm happy he, uh, you know, his wife is happy in Milan, I think. So that's really what matters. Yeah, that might end up as one of those what if moments in the Euroleague offseason history. What if, what if Mike James and Nikola Mirotic join forces together for their first Euroleague title? Ooh, that'd have been nasty. It would have been fun, I think, but you know, things happen for a reason, I guess. But is that usual in Euroleague? Like for star players to recruit other stars to, to Euroleague teams? Because I haven't heard many examples like that, to be honest. Because usually uh, it's, it's the GM, the head coach, and that's it. Nobody asks players' uh, opinion on, on things. Uh, I've been on a few teams that, you know, where you talk to players before, I think, uh, and you try to put in your bid a little bit. I think uh, I talked to Jordan Lloyd quite a bit before he signed. Uh, we had a few conversations before uh, when he was thinking about coming. Uh, I think when I was in Cheska, I talked to uh, Milutinov a couple times about it and just, you know, had conversations. Uh, I don't know if it's recruiting, but, I mean, I'm not doing nothing wrong by having a conversation and, you know, saying some things and telling people what's real and telling people what uh, my vision is for us playing together. So if you're going to come to a team where I'm at, I think it's good to have a conversation. I mean, what can it hurt? Just yeah, to uh, get a rapport and, you know, build something. A lot of players want to know how the organization does. Like a lot of times you'll see how they play, right? That's easy to see. You can play against them, but to get an idea of the professionalism, how your family's being taken care of, um, things on and off the court, the living, those are questions that you can really only have answered by someone who's played on that team. You know, also how the practices are, how the coach, like these are all questions that you might come across. And if someone has children on the team, there might be things you ask about school wise, um, you know, possible daycares, different things you can do. So, you know, it's pretty normal for guys to reach out. Um, you know, maybe they don't probably broadcast it, um, or say nothing too much, but you know, you're going to give them, you know, the real of how it is there and, you know, the good and the bad. And, you know, if it's someone who can help your team or someone who moves the needle, you know, you want to obviously hope they can come. But as players, we're very respectful and you know, you're not going to lie to someone about certain situations. You don't tell the truth, uh, at least uh, most players would. Mike, by the way, what do you think about the other Monaco moves this offseason? I mean, I think that the huge thing for the club was that they kept the core. I mean, a lot of players have stayed. Uh, you added Terry Tarpe, uh really good backcourt, uh, free and deep player who can cover multiple positions. Uh, Mam Jaite, uh, addition in the front line. I would say this move was directed to the French league. I mean, to add another solid uh, French player for the domestic league. And there was also Peter Cornelly, uh, who basically replaced Chimo Moneke, right? And who can stretch the floor uh, a little bit better. At least he's known for uh, for for shooting trees and stuff. W what do you think about these moves? Where was it enough for Monaco to get those, let's say, two wins uh, to win the title for the following season? Uh, I guess this remains to be seen. I haven't seen a, a lot of Tarpe or Jaite. I think uh, I've. I've only played against Jaite once. I think he might have been injured when we played there, honestly. And Tarpe's only been healthy one time when we played against him. So it's hard to tell, uh, especially when you play against teams like that. It's hard to tell with, with how they're going to fit in here and what their role is and just how they're going to adjust. Uh, I've heard great things about both of them. Uh, so, you know, excited to just see how they are and see how they play and how they work and, you know, see how they go through a season. But, uh, Currently, I'm, you know, anytime I can get a shooter to play with, I'm, I'm excited, especially a four shooter, and uh, someone who's known for making threes. I'm always excited about that. I always, I'm always worried about floor space, and I'm always worried about uh, somebody giving me a little bit extra space to operate. So, uh, you know, and we were horrible at shooting threes last year. I think, I think we we're the worst in Euroleague. So, yeah, anytime we can up that, it's beyond incredible. Yeah. How did you feel about these additions uh, in the middle of the free agency where many teams made like crazy moves? That was one of the off seasons that I don't think that we had before. Even Shane Larkin admitted that, that he can't remember 
any of season like that? Um, I think we put our a lot of our eggs in Miritich, which would have been amazing. You know, I think for our team, we I think we needed a four man that could shoot, and I think that's just where we were putting our eggs at, which is a great basket to put your eggs in, honestly. <laughs> And uh, I think uh, Corner Lee is also a, a good player to have. I mean, he's French. He also can shoot. He's tall. He's taller than I thought he was, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited about just how he adjusts. I think in Madrid, uh, they treat their fours and kind of put them in the corner and shoot. I think I'll have a little bit more freedom here to, to do a little bit more. So I'm excited just to see uh, what he does with it and how uh, he adapts. Yeah. So moving forward, just just to clear things up, uh, is there any deadline, any checkpoints, any timeline, you know, for for other potential conversations about your future in the club, or at least that until this day, I have to, you know, I have to clear myself for other teams, let's say that are waiting or that put eggs in, in Mike James' basket. Uh, I think for this season, you know, I'm here and uh, free agency is next summer and we'll see what happens. So the scenario where Mike James have a speech in some random event in front of reporters and basketball fans and says, Monaco are liars and I will never be part of an organization. Let me say that again, Monaco are liars and I will never be a part of an organization. It's not going to happen, right? <laughs> Nah, I ain't gonna say that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm contracted here. I'm gonna fulfill my contract, and then, you know, I'll be, I'll see what happens next summer. I'll probably be a free agent. What was your reaction? Because that's an interesting way to find your way out of the organization, if you want to, you know, make yourself free. <laughs> uh, on one hand, I, I understand them. I think. Uh, I think sometimes people just kind of say things to make it sound good and to make you do what they want. And then if they pull it back, I mean, it's kind of like a betrayal of like your trust and, and the work you put in, you kind of, it hurts. It's, it's a hurt feeling, especially if it's somebody that you get along with and somebody that used to be your friend. Obviously, I don't know exactly what happened. I'm speaking off of just speculation, basically. So, uh, you know, I got to take a pay cut for to get better a team better and you know i guess i'm i'm at, i'm assuming that he got promised a certain amount next summer and an extension and then it gets to that time and after i just did what i did for the team now this is the route you choose that would uh that would make me not want to play for you either honestly so uh on that hand i see it and on the other hand i know it's a business he knows james knows it's a business too and the the business side of basketball sometimes can be ugly and get ugly. So, yeah, I mean, that's just how it goes sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I heard as well. Um, there's got to be a difficult spot when somebody that you trust is encouraging you to take the pay cut and they're promising you an extension. And then when you don't get it, I mean, you're going to feel some type of way. And this is why Mike tells you no discounts on my services just for these type of situations because you never know how things will play out. Um, and I always say, don't believe anything to what's written on paper. Um, so, I mean, this is the life of sports. Also, it was a great time for him to throw, uh, Daryl Morey under the bus. Um, he was in China. If you remember, Morey had some controversial statements about China, um, and was suspended by the NBA. You know, China is a great supporter of the lead, um, financially and viewership wise. And you know, those are things that, you know, they couldn't go through with those type of words and, you know, it was a, you know, kind of could stick it to him a little bit there and then, you know, raise his profile in China, win-win, you know, can't go wrong with that. Yeah, there's there's Damon Lillard's situation as well. Of course, he, obviously, he acts different than uh, James Harden, but, I mean, these players want to change teams and what do you think of the way the players are dealing in the NBA, trying to find their way out and also how it differs from, from Europe and how it should be, actually, in an ideal world. I think um, 
it's always tough. Your emotions are involved. You feel like you give so much to a city. You've been there. So when you think about a guy like Dame, you know, not only has he been, you know, sacrificing his time and doing everything on the court, playing at a high level, um, this is a guy who's active in the community, doing basketball camps, you know, giving back to the people, uh, concerts, shows, you know, all type of thing. I mean, he's embraced it so much. His whole family, um, like the close circle has moved to Portland. I'm talking about mom, sister, brothers, uh, cousins. Uh, everybody's kind of immersed themselves there. Um, they found their place doing different jobs, doing different things. And even his brother there has a football academy, you know, with high school kids, um, getting guys in scholarships, you know, teaching them certain basics and principles. So you see, like, this is a guy who who was giving a lot to the city. And I think he was just frustrated because he saw the team going in a direction that was more of a rebuild and less of a win now mode. And so usually when you're in that situation, you have a conversation and, you know, Dame's a great player, so you can get a lot of pieces for him. Um, if you were going to do that and you wanted to go to rebuild, that's fine. I think they should have used that used him when they got um, the trade with my brother. They could have traded Dame as well, maybe built around Anthony, uh, who's more of a one. Um, and you allow yourself to stockpile picks, young assets, kind of like OKC had done in the past and Philly had did before they got Embiid. And then you can really build something there and you don't have nothing obstructing the young players, you know, growth or development, you know, because when you have talented players, they're going to take away minutes, shots, usage, all type of things that could stunt the growth of a young guy who's emerging, especially with the drafting of School Henderson. You know, that's another really good player. And, you know, it's kind of confusing, kind of like a Monaco situation where you already got Dane, you already got Anthony, then you go get another point guard. I don't understand. Like, it makes no sense. Um, when CJ was there, they said that the backcourt was too small. Scoot's even shorter than CJ. Uh, <laughs> Anthony's the same height as CJ. Like, it's just uh, a circus kind of in that in that regard as far as if that's the case, go get a taller guard. You know, go do certain things differently. Um, the only thing I think Dame should have did differently was he should have requested it privately. I think that would have kept his value high. Teams wouldn't have been aware that he wanted out. And then Portland were able to get a bigger haul. But because he came out publicly... It allowed the whole lead to know that he wants traded. It almost lowers your value because teams know he's disgruntled and he wants to go. And then he limit, limited to just Miami. I think if he had gave them a bigger list privately, he would have had more options. They could have used that because now Portland's in a position where you signed a four-year deal. You can't go anywhere if we don't really want you to. And the, off, the offer that Miami's offering is not enough. Um, Tyler Heroes for Dame and then a couple throw-ins, some picks. I, I mean, I wouldn't do it either. Um, but at this point, he's almost going to be held hostage there and they're going to have a disgruntled star um, or they're going to keep him there for a couple months, let him work his way up and then, you know, move him to a place that maybe he doesn't want to go that has more um, draft picks and players and, and talent on the roster that they're willing to give up because Miami Heat's not willing to disregard their roster and maybe hurt their championship spot without, you know, giving up some of the main guys. They don't want to do that. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Dame has done a lot for for uh, for Portland in general. I'm from Portland, so I've seen him when he got drafted and what he's been doing, and just uh, you know he he's around his family is around, like Eric said. So uh, it's a tough situation. I think uh, when you have somebody giving so much to an uh, organization, and He's basically done all he can. I mean, they haven't really put the best teams around him. I think, you know, they haven't always been great. I think they've had some years where him and CJ kind of just pushed through and made made the team better, but they weren't that great in general. So I think uh, you kind of got to trade him and try to trade him to a good team. But like I said, basketball is a business, even though uh, all the respect they probably have for Dame and all the love they probably have for him, you still have to get a good haul for him because of – just what his value is. So, I mean, it's one of those sticky situations. It's an ugly situation, kind of, just because you kind of want to do right by Dame, but you, you're a GM and you have a job at the end of the day, so you really can't mess that up. So it's like a, you got to find a, a weird in-between. Eric mentioned the Miami Heat situation that basically, you know, frozen Dame's market and situation in the NBA put him as a hostage. C comparing it to Europe, for instance, how it hurts your situation here in Europe when some particular teams, uh, you know, 
being mentioned publicly, when it goes out on public, like Olympiakos case, uh, right? A lot of stuff has been written on Twitter, a lot of rumors. I think that even Panathinaikos owner Dimitris Yanakopoulos said something about you and Olympiakos. How how it hurts the situation? How it hurts the market? Does it have any impact at all? Uh, I think uh, every. I mean, every case is in my case. You know, I, I don't know if it'll hurt other people, but I think uh, my value is my value. I think everybody pretty much knows what uh, when we get on the court, what's gonna happen, what like my value is to to a team and what I can bring to a team. So I think uh, in some cases, just rumors might mess up what somebody has going on, and just. Uh, you know, if you got a rumor about you going to Olympiacos and you really wanted to go to, I don't know, uh, Zagiris, for example, Zagiris might get mad that that rumor is out and take away your offer. But I think uh, uh, in some cases like mine, I think uh, my value is pretty much the same. Whatever rumor is going on, I think uh, teams that want me are just going to want me either way. Or Let's say maybe it's not about the value but about the way that it might stop a potential transfer. For instance, I, I don't want to mention names, but even from this off season, there were there was a situation when a player under under the contract was, let's say, close to signing with another team, but suddenly, yeah. you know, the the first team interrupted and the deal didn't happen. So, how much of impact? Those kind of rumors have, and is it po even possible to control it somehow? I think it does impact um, on a smaller scale as far as <clears throat> making things very uncomfortable or awkward for you if you're in your current team. But also sometimes teams can be petty or be upset. And, you know, if it was quiet and if it happened in the night, they might have let it go. You know, everything's fine. You you communicated with them. But when it gets out, now fans get involved. Now other parts of sponsorship, those type of things come out. And that could maybe deter a team, rather if it just happened, it happened so quickly, it's already done. No one can stop it. So, you know, as far as that, as far as value, like Mike said, you know, it just depends. Um, usually teams are going to pay you what they want to pay you, but, you know, maybe you can get more money if they see that there's someone else who wants you. You know, it's kind of like um, being um, on the dating scene. You know, nobody wants someone who no one else wants. You know, you always get a little bit more attention when you got somebody on your arm, you know, who they, they see it, they're like, ooh. You know, good things happen over there. You know, he's making her happy. You know, you know, I, I, I want to experience that. And that's kind of how basketball is. You know, when you make a team happy, you know, sometimes, you know, other teams aren't happy with their relationship or what they got going on. And, you know, they want to see what you bring to the table, you know. <laughs> and that's what I think that's what we saw with Mike James. You see teams seeing that Monaco Final Four. They seen what he did. And, you know, they they wanted to go on a date with him, you know. <laughs> see, see if they can make it serious. <laughs> I think teams need to grow up, man. If you don't want a player, don't keep him just because you because you don't want somebody else to happen. That's toxic, man. People be doing that in the dating scene too. Don't keep don't keep her just because you know uh, he won her. Nah, I can't let her go no more. <laughs> anyone but him. Up, anyone yeah, but him. Anyone. Nah, I gotta keep her. <laughs> You can't go. You can't go with Drake. Nah, I'm keeping you. You can't be with Drake. <laughs> then if you want to leave, they'll give you a. Make sure you're in a multi-year deal. You can't go. That's the equivalent of having a baby. Put a baby yeah. in there. Ah, she's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> on a more serious note, what do you guys think about commitments nowadays? Because, for instance, as a fan, I'm really excited to see players switching teams, even those players who were under contracts. I mean, it makes the free agency, the whole market way more exciting. Fans like all these movements. But at some point, it's just it feels like it's just too much. Uh, for instance, you see Nikola Mirotic, he signs like five-year deal with Barca or something, and he leaves the club after uh, three years because club wanted some change or they wanted him to reduce the salary in the middle of this whole agreement and stuff. There were other cases where players want to leave. For instance, in the NBA, I don't remember if it was KD or somebody else who signed a max contract and after the first season he wanted to move. So, I mean, are these commitments worth anything nowadays or is it just getting so pure about business and, and that's it? 
I think they, they are worth something for the player. Um, so when a player signs a deal, he's thinking, I'm going to be there. Um, but if things change, right? Um, I signed up. This is how things were when I agreed to come here. And now the organization is taking a shift. It could be a, a management type of style. It could be the president stepping down or changes there, or it could be, um, coaching changes, whatever the philosophy is or a shift in power. When things start to change, that kind of rubs players the wrong way and it makes players want to to leave or to jump shit because this isn't what they agreed to. They agreed to a contract when the scenario or the setting was like A and now things are shifting to B and now you don't know kind of what to do. You're, you're stumbling, you're in mud and you get frustrated and if you don't see that things are changing or getting to where you want it to be, you're going to ask to leave. It happens. Um, as far as organizations, the commitment there, I don't think lasts. I think every player doesn't matter. You could be all year league player, as we've seen, an all world player. Miritich might be one of the best ever four men to ever play in Europe. Um, and you know, they were trying to get rid of him. Um, might have been a, a year league, uh, probably MVP. And you know, the Chester situation happened. Um, you know, you see, even, I mean, Will Clyburn might have had his best season, you know, of his career in the Euro League. He was excellent. And then you heard rumblings and maybe FS1 to give it him. Like, you, it never really goes away. And I think um, teams are always looking for a way to save money, a way to get a player who they might feel can help just as much or better, whatever the case may be. And so that commitment doesn't mean as much. And then they're upset when you don't want to take um, a buyout or less money. Like, you agree to these terms. That's fine. If you don't want me, pay me. And then I'll go my way. But a lot of teams don't want to do that. They want you to find a, a suitor to take some of the contract. No, if you don't want me, pay me. Like, because as a player, I can't say I'm leaving, but I still want you to pay me. And then I want you to find another team that's going to pay the, us, the rest of the salary. Like, you can't do that. As a player, if I say I want to leave, they can literally give me zero. And then I go somewhere else. But as a team, they're not willing to give you 100%. So the, the energy is different. So players, I think, yes, no one changes teams if what you did to get me remains to be the same when I'm there. But organizations, they have more of the power. They have the right in their minds to change up, and you see it constantly. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't want to see the scenario where, let's say, the next season, not even the upcoming season, but the season after, Panathinaikos comes to Kostas Lukas and says, hey, can you just reduce your salary a little bit because we have some <laughs> we're on some budget reduction and when you look at things now i mean the guy made this crazy decision to go from olympiagos to Panathinaikos. of course one of the let's say the list of priority was different but money was also a, a big thing in this whole situation so you sign up with the team also based on the offer that they made and suddenly they start changing terms the the following year so i'm not saying that it's going to happen with pan Haikos. i'm just putting it as a example you know what kind of impact it has for decision making and how unfair it should be for players you know to 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 have teams changing terms suddenly for their own reasons and usually it's there's no like win-win situation for both unless now if if mirotic will get all the contract from from barcelona like 11 million for two years without playing. Okay, Oof, that's, no not, that's not the worst case for the player, but for the club, I just don't <clears> see <throat> the reason. The I cannot explain from the club standpoint, you know, how, why they should go for a move like this and then put all those buyouts for other players, then to also put Corey Higgins on termination and go on court. I mean, I just, sometimes I don't get it how the business works here in Europe. And it's not Wouldn't fair it be because nice imagine, salary cup? yeah, <laughs> imagine if that player um, overperforms his contract. What about a guy who signs a two, three year deal and he he's playing amazing and he's a young guy, first time in the year lead and he's stuck on a three year deal and he's like, you know what? No, I'm not playing. Change my deal. I need more money because I've outperformed this contract. Like teams would never accept this. So to ask a guy to take less, regardless of performance, you signed a multi year deal or if a guy's still playing at a high level. And you ask him to take less is almost disrespectful because you're not appreciative of my craft, the time I've spent. And a lot of players, you only see what they do on the court. You're not seeing the growth, how they're taking young players under their wing, um, leading the team when there's conflicts, internal rifts, helping the guys, having dinners at their house, doing certain things. Being a, If you're a vet, you might be helping guys out off the court, on the court, financially, different things, uh, advice, life lessons, all these type of things. And so for you to ask someone to take less money, it's almost like... 
you're disregarding everything I bring to organization, even helping you sign players. You know, you call me or you call Mike and you need help with a player. Like these are all things that I'm doing because I'm satisfied with our terms. Now, the moment I don't become satisfied with these terms, now you're giving me less. Maybe I should give you less. You know, I'll still do my job on the court, but don't ask for nothing else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Of course, I think it I depends agree. on. <laughs> I also think it depends on, you know, each organization is different. And I believe that there are organizations, both in Euroleague or other European leagues, that recognize, let's say, the improvement of a player and gives a recognition based on a, you know, increase on the contract. Like, it, I think it happened with Sasha Vezenkov, right? He was on a really team-friendly contract when he started performing at MVP level and they suddenly, okay, they extended the contract, but they also changed the terms of the current contract. So some 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 organizations, they recognize improvements, developments, and do things how it should be uh, then, fair for, for every, both sides. For every one of those cases, you got a Tyrese Rice who was on a smaller contract at Maccabi, won the year lead, was dominant in the Final Four, I think Final Four MVP. They didn't want to pay him, had to leave, went to Kimke, then ended up going to Barcelona. Then you had Mike James at Basconia, came from um, Colossal Rose, came young player, signs the buyout, gets them to the Final Four. They didn't up his contract the second year. They kept him on that same two year he had. Darius Adams was killing. Great. Like for every player that gets one chance like that, there's probably like 50 who don't get nothing. I, I know my first year when I started to make money. Like teams don't, when you get stuck on that two-year deal, you paying that buyout or you stuck. Like it's just how it goes. And I mean, it's unfortunate, but that is nice how they did Sasha. But I also think they did that because he's also Greek. Um, he's one of them. When you're a foreigner, no matter how much, you know, you immerse yourself in the culture, they'll never quite see you as one of them. You know, you could do stuff in the community. You can embrace yourself. You can be a great person. But at the end of the day, a Greek player in Greece is going to get treated different than American in Greece. The same with a Lithuanian player in Lithuania. It's going to be treated different than American. It doesn't. And it's not like personal. It's just it's natural for fans and um, management to connect to someone that they've seen as a kid growing up through the system. Growing up, they probably know his family. Um, maybe there's someone in his family that played within the organization. And you've seen that kid for 20 years and now he's a man. So you feel like almost like he's part of your family. You're more likely to work with him than the guy you just seen on YouTube or through an agent's video clip. And now he's on your team. Yeah, j just for a fact, Vezenko was born in Cyprus, but he's Bulgarian. But he also got Greek citizenship because he was living there at his youth age. Let's say he was... He got a lot uh, going on. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it sound like to me? <laughs> it would be nice if we had a salary cap and everybody could have like salaries, like and have a max and get traded. That would, that would put be nice. some system in Europe that we're lacking of. Yeah, know, we, it, it, we about twenty years away from that, but yeah, it would be nice, right? Because the only problem is you would have to eliminate some of the teams who don't want to spend. So if you did a salary cap. Like those bottom teams, Asville can't can't do a salary cap that's comparable to a Barcelona, a Monaco this year, Panathinaikos. And that, like, I mean, maybe they could, but they don't. Um, you know, Munich historically hadn't done it this year. They increased their budget. Like, there's a lot of teams that, if you did a salary cap, depends what the number would be. You know, I think it would maybe help even things up, but it would maybe lower salaries unless they shrunk the yearly if they didn't have as many teams then i think maybe right. they could have a high salary cap and you can get traded you can get traded i think that would add to the mystique i think that's what helps the nba um the free agency signings the trades always like things constantly happening i think that the product of the nba basketball yes it gets great reviews but the things that happen off the court the drama I think that's what ties fans in. And I think if they bring that to you early, I'd be curious if that would also increase viewership and some of the excitement around the game and the product. And it would make contracts easier because you basically know who's the max player right when you get into the free agency. It's just who go off from the max. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't really got it. It's less negotiation. It's just, all right, you know, this is what I'm getting. This how many years. 
You might not need an agent. You can keep your own 10%. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Don't need nothing. Hey, that, ain't, that ain't a bad idea sometimes. That's what I'm saying. I just walk right in and just, hey, man, <laughs> you know what it is. Speaking of trades, I had this question for Eric. Since I don't want to put Mike in an uncomfortable situation, this is the oh, question shit. only addressed for, for Eric. So let's say Mike gets traded. Let's say we have uh, the salary cap, the trade system, everything, and Mike gets traded. There are three teams, three potential destinations for Mike James. Olympiacos, Partizan, and Barcelona. Could you rank best destinations for Mike if, if let's say, if he theoretically leaves Monaco on a trade? Number one, Olympiacos. I think um, they lacked a pure score, um, someone who could get in the paint, do damage from the outside. Um, they had shooters, they had slashers, um, and then they had a pick and roll player, they had a defender. But they didn't have someone who can shoot, slash, and play pick and roll. And I think that would kind of help them when they have lures or when they're, you know, struggling to find offense, especially after losing Sasha, you're losing almost 20 points a game. I think Mike could fill that void. And then he has a magnetic effect where like when he gets the ball, defenders kind of get stuck to him. And that kind of opens up easy opportunities and shots for other players. And um, I know Barjokas has played with guys who are heavy usage, high volume guys, and he's done really well with them in the system. And I think we've seen Mike's growth every year, especially last year, just showing like even when the ball not in his hands all the time, he still affects the game and he was able to still be effective with probably a lower usage rates than historically. And, you know, the team had success, you know, they were winning. Number two, I would say, I would say Barcelona because they also lack that type of player. Um, I like Mike to be in a situation where they need a guy to go get a bucket to be who he is so he's not handcuffed, so he's not restrained. I think a lot of players have talent, but when you put them in a box, they can't be who they are. So if you put him in a Barcelona system, that Spanish lead is up-tempo with his speed, with his explosiveness. Even at 33, he's still one of the fastest guys on the court. You get him in that open court, it's going to be lots of problems. Um, you pair him in that offense with that ball swinging, it's moving, you're doing certain things. And, you know, it's a good lead for him, too, because in the Spanish league, they try to save, you know, guys minutes. Maybe he's playing 23 to 24 minutes a night in the Spanish league. And then the Euro league probably play more heavier minutes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they lack a player who can go get a bucket. And then after losing Miritic, another 20 point a game score, you're going to need a guy to fill that void. How many guys can come in and step that up? I know they say it's a, a approach where you get multiple guys to do it. Um, that sounds nice in theory, but there's going to come a time when you need a guy to hit a big shot. And who has the balls to do that? Who has the courage that if I miss it, I can live with myself? Those guys who you get by committee, by committee are not going to be able to do that. You know, you need a guy who's an alpha. Um, and then partisan, I just, I don't dislike it, but I don't like it for him just because they already have Kevin Punter. They have a guy who scores, who creates. They do need a point guard. Um, but especially after using Mater and Exum. But I just feel like he would be more valued in those systems because there's no one who can just manufacture offense on their own. Whereas there, they have that in KP. So maybe you could put them together. Yeah, it would be explosive. But I'm going strictly off value, need by basis. And those two places need him. And what I've seen in Mike's career is, and he knows it, it's better to be needed than wanted. You can't survive without a player if you need him. If you want him, player, it's nice. It's an accessory. Yeah, it works. But, you know, I think it's, it suits better the opposite way. And Partizan had a lot of success. They're probably going to try to run it back. And if they didn't reach that same level or whatever, I don't want him to be in a situation where he would get blamed. You know, where he goes to Barcelona, it's a new coach, new staff. Everything's new. Who's coming in new together is perfect. Or if he goes in Olympiacos, the base is already made. The core is there. They're just missing a guy like him. Yeah, re regarding Olympiacos, uh, we have BN Plus members group on WhatsApp. Uh, these are our subscribers that joined our community on basketnews.com slash plus. And I, at first I was skeptical about Mike James fitting Olympiacos, but there was a member, I think her name is Alexandra, and he mentioned a few things that I really forgot about. For instance, that Mike already played with Isaiah Kane and, and Alec Peters in Phoenix. He also played with Lerenzakis and Colossus Rhodes. He played with Milutinov and CSKA. It turns out he recruited him to CSKA. 
uh, he played with Thomas Walkup in TBT tournament, right? And basically, it's half of Olympiago's team already. And uh, I was kind of skeptical because there's still a lot of traffic on Olympiago's backcourt. But as Eric mentioned, Mike brings something different that other guards don't have. And I was also skeptical about playing in Bartsoka system, which might be tough uh, for players who are not used to sit out the entire quarter, for instance. But at the same time, we can all remember that there was Malcolm Delaney, super successful in Lokomotiv when Barsokas was, was the head coach. He made the first all EuroLeague team that year and Lokomotiv made the final four. There was Tyrese Rice in Barcelona. Barsokas had Alexei Schud in Himki. And then, of course, Lucas was basically his go-to guy on Olympiakos. So when you put all those pieces, it really makes sense. And I, w- I would agree with Eric's order than going with Barca because they really lack of score and... Partizan, I, I, I also think that guy like Nick Kalatis maybe fits them a little bit better than Mike, knowing their needs at the moment. Although the lineup with Mike and KP would be crazy. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. By the way... You don't have to come in, Mike. We don't want to get you in any hot water. You know, you're in Monaco. I'm just hanging out, man. <laughs> you're enjoying that sunshine. You know, you're on yacht parties, whatever. Relax, chill out. <laughs> but we, we mentioned two teams that signed former NBA players. Barca brought Jabari Parker. Uh, Partizan brought PJ Dozier. Uh, there were some other moves the last week. But what do you think about these two particular moves? I like PJ Dozier. I mean, he's coming off an injury, um, but before the injury, you know, he was explosive, fast. He was getting the lane. He was on those Denver teams, you know, showed his uh, propensity to get in the lane, to make things happen. And that's something that Partizan uh, needed with XM leaving. They needed someone who can get downhill, who can push and transition, who can get paint touches and who can create for other people. I think he's a better passer than XM. Uh, I think there's going to be an adjustment period. We've seen it with Exxon when he left Barcelona. You know, this is a guy who was only scoring four to five points a game, was trying to figure himself out. I'm not sure it will be as great a adjustment because he's going into a position of point guard with the ball in his hands, where Exxon in Barcelona was more used as a three. So anytime you have that ball constantly in your hands, it's easier to find a rhythm and a flow. Um, but there will be a period where he has to adjust and adapt. And Abravich is extremely tough on his point guard. So... Yeah, I don't know his character or his mental fortitude, but he's going to have to be extremely tough minded, um, being able to be coached. And I'm sure Partizan did their due diligence and did their homework and found out, you know, what he is capable of and not mentally. And, you know, if he figures it out, I think he could be a good fit there. He has good size. That's, I like that fit. Um, yeah, I've, I, I, re- I received a lot of feedback from the NBA people about his, you know, off court stuff and just positive things coming about PJ those years. So at least from that part, there shouldn't be any problems. He's also very talented, really good guy. It on, the only thing is, you know, if he can stay healthy, if he can play consistent games with this yearly schedule, with the Adriatic League, I mean, it's not easy to handle 80 intensive games compared to the NBA. So, I mean, a lot of NBA newcomers in Europe bringing this, you know, question mark, if he, if they can you know keep with this schedule, probably they think that okay you play less games in the NBA it should be a little bit e- easier. But I believe that the adjustment might be really hard. It might hit them really hard because they gotta actually practice now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in Jabari Parker actually. If he stay healthy, like people like that that are big and can move, they play the four, they cause matchup problems overseas. And if he can move like how he used to before, if he can shoot a little bit and make the shots, I think it'll be he'll be a tough matchup. When you're when you're that mobile and that big at the force, it it, it causes problems in Europe because he's basically a three in the league, a three four. But then normally three fours when they come to Europe, they're fours, and uh, they're usually just a little bit too athletic for people, or they shoot a little too well. Kind of like Derek Williams ca- causes a lot of problems. Yeah. Kind of similar like that. I wanted he, to bring this name up because it, it sounds like you're speaking about Derek Williams, to be honest. So mm-hmm. Yeah, he causes a lot of problems. They athletic, they can shoot a little bit. They they can dribble a little bit because they played on the wing in the NBA and they worked on their game. So uh, if Jabari Parker can stay healthy, I think it's just, it could be interesting how he plays, honestly. 
I'm wondering if they're going to allow him the freedom to play his style. I know in Spain they don't really like a lot of one-on-one, and if they do, it comes from the guards because he's a guy who's really good in isolation, um, who's really good at taking bigs off the bounce. And so if they take away this part of his game, I think we'll only see maybe 60% of his true self. Um, also, like, pick and pop situations, um, they don't really have – a magnetic guard where he's coming off that screen where you have to really stop the ball and give a lot of def- defensive attention. Uh, but he can definitely do switches and he can attack um, those slower fours and post up those smaller threes. But I hope that they let him, you know, get some ISO work. I know it's not the Spanish way, but, you know, he's a guy that could really help to manufacture some points and do some things that in that mid post that could be really, be- really, really beneficial to them. One of the guys from the Euroleague that might still be on the move is Nicolates. And I remember we had a discussion about him before the last season. And you guys thought that Nick will thrive in Fenerbahce with Bielitsa, will be, will be getting around him. And we all thought that it too, the system is a better fit for Nick when it was uh, playing under Charles. But I mean, as I said, now it feels like he might be on the move again. It's been quiet for, for a while, but there were a lot of rumors that he might go to Partizan. Uh, and it, especially when Fenerbahce signed Raul, Raul Neto, it's, it's, it's hard to see Nick staying in Fenerbahce. What do you think? Are you surprised that his tenure in Fenerbahce might be over after one season? What went wrong? Or is it only about shooting? I think, uh, in my opinion, it kind of looked like a Tudis. I don't know if panic, panic might be too strong of a word. But I think everything was good working early on and they were healthy and Nick was running the show, finding people for passes, doing basically what Nick does, causing problems on defense. And I think when Scotty got hurt and you lose that level of shooting and, and, it, and you got to go a little bit bigger and Nick doesn't have as much space to kind of be him, I think it kind of uh, hampered his performance. And I think Atutis might have uh, – started having him on a little bit of a shorter leash. And I think once that happened, it just, it didn't work out in general for them. Uh, I think when Nick plays with a shorter leash, his, his jumper looks a little bit shorter. His passes don't look as sharp. His confidence goes down and he, uh, you know, it got a little wrong for him. Cause I think in the first 10, 11 games, what were they like nine and one, nine and two, 10 and one, something like that. Yeah. They were on so, the top of the settings. So I think uh, when everybody was healthy and he had shooters around him and he was uh, making plays, I think he looked like old Nick. I think he was – him and Motley were probably their best players at one point. So, uh, you know, I think uh, just, you know, injuries happen and, and kind of changes the uh, the makeup of your team and, and things change a little bit. And Scotty was playing really well at the beginning too, which also helped out Nick a whole bunch. So I think uh, – yeah, injuries just kind of messed up their season a little bit. Messed up the dynamic of their season a little bit. Yeah, they were flowing. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I think that Nick didn't shoot the ball bad. Um, I think it was actually one of his best years shooting the three. He was a little under 34%, and he made some timely threes. Um, I think they didn't get out in transition as much as I expected them to. And definitely there was a lot of constant movement and changes. Um they kind of had too many players. Um, you know, me and in the Turkish League, I saw them every. It was almost like a, a football team. It was so many players, and they were constantly signing guys. And every time you sign a guy, that changes that that dynamic a little bit. They had a good thing going when it was Nick and um, Scotty, and they had like a rhythm going. And then, you know, you start signing another player who's a good player in his own right, Tyler Dorsey. But now you have to give him touches. That pushes Carson Edwards further to the bench. Now you have them all fighting for touches, trying to get a rhythm. And then the style of play is different. Um, with Scotty in, you know, he's going to be used more as a shooter and straight attack situations. Um, Dorsey liked to play with the ball a little bit to get into his shots, rhythm dribbles. Um, Carson Edwards, you know, wants the ball in his hands a little bit too. So it kind of took away from a little bit, you know, early in the year. Um, it was a lot of pick and roll with him and Miley. You know, they had a really good connection. I liked what they did. I think they were very successful. But when the injuries came and teams started to adjust, um, you know, things weren't as easy or as effortless for that team. And, you know, I, I think that you have to remember it was their first year together. I mean, you're talking about 11, 12 new players who've never played together, 
Um, and you're bringing them all in from different situ- situations, different styles of play, different leads. And considering that, they had a good season. I mean, they made it to the playoffs. You have a new coach. And me personally, I would have continued to bring that same team back and, you know, did some things. If there was a problem with Nick shooting, it doesn't make sense to sign Neto. Um, he's not a shooter either. He plays similar to Nick, a little bit shorter, not as good a passer, a little bit more active, probably a little quicker, but less experienced in Europe. You know, I think it's just basically a smaller version of Nick. But, you know, at that point, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, they have the budget, they have the money, and, you know, they kind of change players like musical chairs. Yeah. I mean, especially after Olympiago series, a lot of people brought shooting on the spotline. Uh, spotlight uh, again Nick was three of ten during the series against Olympiacos but he was neither the first nor the last playoff player that you know had issues with shooting for instance I checked some stats Alpha Diallo was one of 14 in the series against Maccabi Gerald Martin was three of 20 and these guys like I mean they can make shots they can make trees but in the playoffs they struggle you know to uh, to make those shots and I just had this you know question in my mind how do you try to hide players when they have some shooting issues or they some of guys can't shoot or how to do you try to encourage your teammates when they're you know going through these uh, tough slumps uh me personally when people are open on my team and they don't shoot i get upset <laughs> for one because I get a lot of attention already and a lot of doubles and extra people coming over to help. So the right play and shot is you being open and for you to shoot it. So when you don't mm-hmm. make that, when you don't shoot it at all, if you miss it, it's a different story. But when you don't shoot it at all, now that defense worked. Now we didn't even get an open shot. Now you didn't shoot it. You dribbled out. You pass to somebody else, and now we're in an ISO. So now that defense is going to continue to do that. If you shoot it three times in a row and even you make one, your defender is going to start thinking like, dang, he did make one. So you not shooting it is just hurting our cause and hurting what we're going to do moving forward. If you make all three, then they won't ever do that again. But if you on my team, I'm on you about shooting shots in the gym. So you've been shooting and you've been working on your game. Don't work on your game and then not get in the game and be wide open and don't shoot. So for me, that's just what I'm going to tell my teammates every time. You got confidence, you work on your game, and then you get an open shot, shoot it. I mean, that's what you're here for. Because yeah. if I got to have open shot, I'm going to shoot it. So if you got an open shot, you should shoot it every time. I don't care if you miss four in a row. If coach want to take you out after you miss five in a row, okay, but shoot the shot. Yeah, and it mess, messes up the offense. Um, you know, guys are in position, rebound position. Even if you miss, you might get an old board. And like Mike said, it makes your life hard if guys don't shoot open shots because now they can really shrink the court. But, I mean, all you can do is instill confidence in them. Um, teammates encourage them. The leader encourage them, the coaches. But at the end of the day, you're a professional. If you put the work in, you got to believe in your – the preparation, you got to believe in the time you put in. If you're missing shots, get in the gym more. Spend more time shooting. You know, if I see a guy missing shots, you know, it's all in love. I'll talk a little joke with him, maybe maybe talk a little mess and be like, hey, bro, get in the gym. I mean, your jumper been looking a little flat, you know, and, and but I'm the type of guy where you can do that to me too. Like, I'll even call, I'll be like, man, I'll 0 for 5 from 3 last game. I got to get me in the gym. My jumper was broke. Like, and you have that type of energy and you can hold yourself accountable you know, I think other people respond to it. It's not like you're calling somebody out. You're not doing it in public. You're just talking to them personally because you want to see each of your teammates succeed because if each player succeeds, the team succeeds. If each player gets better, the team gets better. And, and that's all it is. If you get that kind of dialogue and, you know, the leaders have that type of relationship, you're only going to help the team. You're only going to help each individual player. It's a win-win for everybody. And then it makes, you know, the main guys or, you know, as Mac would say during the salary cap, the max players, you know, makes their job easier because you need the others to hit shots and to make things happen to kind of open up the court. Shooters is always going to have a job, man. They always going to have a job. <laughs> There's also one shooter that I have a question from BN Plus member, uh, Johannes Meeves. 
uh, that he addressed before the podcast. Why does Eric believe so much in Carson Edwards? First of all, I think that not just Eric believes so There's much in Carson Edwards. There's a lot of people Edwards. that like Carson Edwards. Exactly. A lot yeah. of people like him. I think for me is just how I evaluate the game. Um, in basketball, offense is coveted. You can say what you want, but the guys who get paid the most are very good offensive players. The guys who make the all year league teams are very good offensive players. When you look at a guard, you know, the first thing you're going to see is the physique. You know, you're going to look at the size. Okay. He's not that tall, but he's extremely strong. He's built like a fire hydrant. You know, he's sturdy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you like, man, this dude is like, you can't move him. Like, like he's, he's explosive. He's fast. He jumps high. He's good in transition. He's good in the half court. Um, I think he needs to work on his shot selection and his patience. You know, that comes with age, that comes with maturity, but that also comes with minutes in a row. If you put a young player with his back against the wall and you don't give him minutes, you don't give him any opportunities to succeed. The moment he gets out there, he's going to be thirsty. He's going to do whatever he can to try to show his way that he needs more time. So if you give a player like that more minutes, he's going to be able to show you his full game. I think if you see some clips of him there's a reason he went to the nba there's a reason you know he was one of the top scorers in college like any guy who can shoot from the three with range off the dribble or catch and shoot any guy who can get to the mid-range pull up or any guy who can finish in traffic with the bigs um they're going to have success he's a three level scorer but he does need to work on you know sometimes pulling up more and not going into the trees as much there's definitely parts of his games he needs to i don't even want to say improve but just focus on more as he adjusts to Europe, but it's his first time in Europe. Um, you know, people were ready to jump off the shift on X in, in Barcelona. You know, he looked awful. And then at Partizan, you know, the fans were begging him not to leave because he was a focal point of the team and made so many changes. I mean, you look at a lot of guys, Misic, when he's at Zagiris, I mean, what he scored? Six points a game? You know, he was a defender. Wade Baldwin. Yeah, Wade Baldwin. And, <laughs> like, you, so many players. So give him, this is one year. Give him another year, and you're going to see a player who's probably getting utilized, right, who has confidence instilled in him. But offense translates everywhere, and he can do a lot of things on the court. So you'll review this. You'll probably wonder. I was also high on Motley. I was also high on Darius Thompson. Like Usually when I see something, it usually translates at all levels. And these are guys that, you know, I don't like to say I'm right, but I was <laughs> right. So just wait. We'll revisit this and just look at the skill set. Don't look at the finish system. You know, look at this skill set, look what a player brings, and you put him with a coach like Paolo Lasso, you're going to see that probably thrive in that environment. Does he remind you more of uh, baby Shane Larkin, as many compare him to, or he has some similar similarities even with Mike? I say he shoots it from the tray like, like Shane does, but he's good at attacking getting to the basket drawing fouls like mike is like shane was very athletic you know before some of the injuries but he has mike's explosiveness in his burst like when they get the ball like it's like a different gear like he has that um and he reminded me of a young young mike at basconia you know he probably shoots the three a little better you know but that's how it was like mike was a guy who was getting to that cup slashing and then he developed that jumper more years. I mean, he probably had it, but he was just so good getting to the basket. He didn't want to use it. You know, I think he, he's more of a shooter than a slasher, but he can slash. Mike was more of a slasher than a shooter, but he could shoot. Young Mike, that is. Basconia Mike. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not anything no more, man. I'm just a humble basketball player trying to make it. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, speaking about it, this off season, a lot of crazy moves were made. Uh, I can mention a few of them, like Campasa returning to Madrid, Kevin Punter staying in Partizan, Campbell Walker going to Monaco, Jabari Parker, Willie Hernan Gomez to Barca, Shabazz Napier to Red Star, Papayanis Rolneto to Fenerbahce, Matias Lazor to Panthnaikos, Darius Thompson to Efes, Mirotic to Milan, Milotinov to Olympiakos, Panthnaikos made bunch of big moves like Slukas, Juancho, Hernan Gomez, Lazort. Which of these moves like hit you the most? Like maybe, you know, they they were really surprising to you or some of th these moves where you were like, oh, this is a very smart move. I mean, which moves impress you the most from all of these signings? 
impressed me the most. Um, I like Darius Thompson to Memphis. I feel like he's like the balance they need, and he's like another big guard because he's next to Shane. Who's, you know, he even short for my standards a little bit. I'm taller than Shane. I hope he sees this too. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think that's a good balance. Added another tall point guard to that who likes to pass and. Mm-hmm. and uh, gets people involved. So I, I really like that move. I, I can see that working well. I think uh, Sluka signing the panel was a shock to everybody. Uh, I think that was a big move just for the balance of power. I don't know if it is. I don't know how it's actually going to work because it's obviously his first year and that's basically an all-new team with an all-new coach. So uh, you always got to hold your judgment until that you see what it actually looks like just because, you know, you never really know what's going to happen when an all new team comes in with all new players, all new coach and staff, and just uh, just how everything will adapt and gel together. So I'm uh, I'm interested in seeing what that looks like too. And uh, yeah, some of the other moves I knew were going to happen, so they didn't surprise me as much. I was privy to that information, so it, it didn't it didn't shock me. It came across my ticker like Woj before it actually, you know, <laughs> got released. By the way, one last rumor about Mike James. Is that true that in the beginning of the free agency, Pant Nikos aggressively tried to approach you and sign for the team? Um, I don't know how aggressive it was. I think... Uh, I think uh, me and DPG have a semi-solid relationship, uh, you know. So we talk often. I think uh, I think he might have asked a question just what my status was, and I, you know, just told him I didn't think I was leaving. I think I was staying. I think, and you know, it wasn't really worth a conversation right now, just because I didn't see uh, me going anywhere. Um, you know. And uh, yeah, I don't I don't know how aggressive that is. I think it's just that was just like the conversation that kind of stopped after that. And I think we started talking about like uh, like his family or something after that. I don't know something regular conversations, but I think uh, it basically stopped right there. I think uh, if uh, you know some things would have been different, or if it had been later or anything like that, I, maybe more of a conversation would have been had, but. And I think you were good. Time. You were a good fit for Ottoman system. He would love to have a guard like you for sure. You've been playing about thirty-seven, thirty-eight minutes a game though, but um, <laughs> you would have yeah. that ball in your hands, and it'd be featured for sure. I hear rumors that he he likes it. He likes uh, me as a basketball player. I heard those rumors, but uh, oh, you, oh you his style, you his style. He loves scoring <laughs> guards, bro. He loves scoring guards. So, and then your history with Panthinikos, like. If Monaco don't want to solidify your future next year, I'm sure DPG won't be too far behind. Yeah, you know, uh, June's a long time away. You know, I'm uh, interested to see what happens then. But right now I got about, uh, what, what am I, about 10 months left? Yeah, 10 months left because you know the French lead is the longest in in Europe. And then uh, maybe another final think- four run, see what happens. You know, I'm just trying to figure it out. I got to. You know, hopefully I can get me a scoring record this year and see what happens. By the way, I believe, that, I believe that many Panathinaikos fans would like to hear from you as, you know, from ex Pana player. What do you think about their rebuild? I mean, they had a big task this offseason because, first of all, I think that it's very hard to um, earn the respect of star signings, star players, you know, to believe in the project, to believe in the rebuild. And, uh, you know, to take those risks, like Kevin Punter said, he didn't want to be the part of the rebuild anymore. So he chose to stay in Partizan. There was this Barcelona case, of course, but still the main point was this. And I, from what I heard, at at least in the beginning of the free agency, uh, there were big free agents who had question marks about Panaikos and didn't want to go there at first. But I believe that Sluka's move this brave move by Lucas kind of played as a domino effect and it kind of pursued other big signings, you know, to 
let's say, to have a different approach on Panthnaikos, uh, um, committing to Panthnaikos. So how do you think they did this job, knowing all these, you know, conditions, giving all these uh, situations, and now basically them being just one signing away from completing the roster? Uh, my message to the fans would be, be patient. I think fans and organizations get too caught up in things having to work right away. And I know it's not a lot of games in EuroLeague, so it's not working right away. It can kind of be troublesome. But when you get a brand new team and you've had teams over the last five years that you just say, ah, we don't like this one and ah, we don't like this one. And you re and you're constantly signing more and different players and more and more. I think eventually you have to stop doing that and keep a group of guys together and try to see what can happen. I think uh, just they have a perfect example right across the road from there that Olympiacos basically just keeps the same guys together and they work it together and and figure it out. So I think uh, Panathinaikos fans and ownership and GMs and coaches, they all need to be a little bit patient. I mean, I'm not saying it, it, won't, it could just work right away and you don't have to be patient at all, but I think uh, with the players they signed, they signed some pieces that they can keep there for a while, keep there for many years, so they need to, even if it doesn't work out well, if they start two and four or if they start five and four or something like that, I think uh, just be a little patient, let, let the the pieces work where they may let people figure out what their role is. Let people get into at least February before you start saying, all right, maybe this didn't work. Maybe we need to get somebody else for next season, but at least see how the dynamics work and how pieces fall together before you make your ultimate decision. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Not, not just fans need patient, patience, uh, although so, so yeah, but that's that's the thing that we're missing bad here in Europe. So, and Patience it's not is, the is a virtue. <laughs> yeah, and we're not living in in an ideal world. So, and basketball here is a very passionate thing. So, and it usually eliminates the factor of uh, patience. But guys, mm, going to the end, uh, just recently, a nice group of gentlemen, including. Greg Popovich, Dirk Nowitzki, Pau Gasol, Tony Parker, and Dwayne Wade were inducted in the ba Basketball uh, Hall of Fame. And I thought that if you were inducted in some kind of European or EuroLeague uh, Basketball Hall of Fame and you had this privilege you know, to give a speech in front of European basketball audience and the most important basketball people uh, in this continent, who would you pick on stage to present you into the Hall of Fame? You mean like you want big basketball you names pick, or you want people who know you? I would pick people who know me, people close to me. Anybody. Yeah, I would pick my brother for sure. Okay. 100%. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I could, could, could predict it, so. I just feel like he the best person who knows me. Um, he knows our struggle, our grind, our rise up the ranks, you know, from being undervalued or um, underranked and then, you know, kind of making something of yourself, but also – Oh, he's a good speaker. Um, he has charisma. He's a good storyteller. So when you're thinking about who you want to represent you, you want someone who kind of knows your your grind, your struggle, your story, but you also want someone who can kind of put into context and, and keep the crowd entertained. And you know, I think he's the guy for me. Yeah, that's a good, solid pick. And Mike had all the time to think about his selection. <laughs> And I was thinking the whole time. I was just thinking that, like, <laughs> that's ah. what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> ah, I don't know who I would say. I think, uh, I think most people normally pick a basketball player. So that is what kind of uh, hampers it for me. I think I have some friends that are basketball players, but I think they would be terrible at, at the job. Like, uh, <laughs> I think they would just do a bad job. Um, don't let Will speak for you, bro. <laughs> Yeah, Will's not doing a good job. I, I think Kevin will be horrible. Uh, maybe James Gist. Maybe he'll be a good one. Uh, there you go. James yeah. Gist might be all right. He might be solid at it. He's solid at telling stories. Yeah. He's kind of funny. He's funny. He's funny. Yeah, yeah he's kind of like funny. James. He'll probably make some jokes. It'll be all right. 
Yeah. Hopefully that's a good he shave his head before he comes. But... <laughs> <laughs> Can't come with that shadow, huh? No five o'clock nah, shadow. Nah, I don't, I don't need to see the, the whatever that is he'd be having. <laughs> the sunroof halfway back. Yeah, I don't want to see that. <laughs> no, By George the way, what- Jefferson. <laughs> he gonna roast me for this. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, what's going on there between Will and Shane, and with this Shane doll or whatever it is? I don't, I don't. Will, see, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to talk about <laughs> Will or Shane. Actually, I'm sick of both of them at this point. <laughs> okay, but those those things are really getting weird. And just just for the very end Mike turns 33 tomorrow so happy b- birthday Mike Thank happy you. birthday 33 the semi old OG <laughs> <laughs> I'm still the oldest player on my team man so you know I'm old out here <laughs> I don't know how I got here to the old person on the team but I'm here now <laughs> and that's like- usually usually people around you know share their wishes birthday wishes but what would be your birthday wish to yourself just to you know have a healthy season huh? you know stay injury free that's all i want to do it's only basketball related wishes the first thing that comes to your mind right yeah, yeah right now yeah for sure just injury free healthy and injury free For the whole family, actually. Just healthy and injury-free. I hate seeing people getting injured, and it would be even worse if I did. So, yeah. Yeah, and so since Mike is turning 33, Eric is 35, usually, for some reason, I have very old players on my podcast all the time, but I was thinking about you guys. Uh, what would be your dream scenario to finish the career? Where you would like to play, play where you would like to go, Do you have any like particular ideal world uh, situations? For me, I'd like to finish um, in Turkey. I think um, just comfortable there. My family's there. Um, the weather's nice, easy adjustment. And, you know, I've become accustomed to, you know, the culture and everything there. So, you know, I always joke with my life. My wife always, um, after that time, um, we had been in Turkey for a couple of years and then we left. We went to Russia. We were there for four years. And, you know, she got tired of the weather and, you know, she was like, it's tough, it's tough, it's dark, you know, it's, the weather's bad, it's cold. And I just told her like, look, towards the end of my career, I'll go back to Turkey, I'll pick a nice place for us. And, you know, that's kind of what I did. And, you know, hopefully I can just continue to play at a high level. Hopefully, um, you know, my services are still respected and, you know, if possible, you know, I'd like to finish, you know, in Karshiaka. You know, I don't know if that's two years, three years, I don't know, you know, depending on how the body feels, but, You know, if I could finish there just because I know the staff, I built a good relationship, found an uh, international school for my son, uh, everything smooth, find a dope apartment. I'm cool with, you know, going out there, go out healthy. I will never go out not being able to play at my level. I don't care. Um, my son and my wife will only see me playing at a high level. Um, the moment I can no longer demand double teams or, you know, be a focal point of a team's defensive plan, it's time to quit because I will not play. Um, <laughs> uh, a bum roll. <laughs> I would not like this is just not for me. Um, I just because then my son won't even listen to me if he does decide to pick up <laughs> basketball. He'll be looking like, Daddy, you are on the bench. Like, get out of here. Like, <laughs> so it's just high level role. Um, still playing on good team. And you know, once I can no longer be Eric McCullum, um, then it's time to drop. I'm okay being, you know, second option, third option. You know, once you start getting below that. Um, for me, I think um, I play long enough. I've done enough things off the court, you know, financially to secure myself. Where I'll be like, it's time. Let me give it to the young players. Yeah, I like how you're using this platform for your contract extension with Karshiaka. That's that's nice. <laughs> that's, nice. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, move. hopefully they hear me. Hopefully they hear me. You know, and they they get it. Oh, Karshiaka you know? fans, they for sure they're hearing you. So I mean, we got to the final, you know. I did what I could, you know. Can't be mad at that. Going against 10 times budget, it, it was tough. You know, 10 to 12 time budget, it ain't easy, but we did what we had to do. Huh? <laughs> I gotta respect that. 
What what about you, Mike? You're trying to get me in trouble. That's I see. <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really. Maybe you have some crazy right. dreams about playing in China because there are some players who really want to retire in China. Although I think it's a I'm tough right. league, league to retire. I mean, you're gonna be beaten okay. over there. I got a. Uh, I think I got like two or three years left, and wherever I, wherever the sweepstakes take me in June, that's where I'm gonna retire at. Mike been saying two or three years for the last two <laughs> or like three, two or three years, years exactly. since he was 30. <laughs> Mike is going to play to about 36, 37, then he's going to walk away. That's only three years from now. I'm a, nah. <laughs> What's going to happen is, is my sweet steak is in June. I'm going I'm to hand out tickets and, you know, people are going to join up and somebody going to, you know, sign me for two or three years and then I'm going to just bow out after that. Yeah, so Lucas got a three-year deal at 33. You get your three-year deal at 33, that takes you to 36. Beautiful. Yeah, two, three years ago, those 33, 34 players weren't signing like 9, 10 million contracts. So the landscape has changed. So It's because some... the new crop ain't came in yet. The new crop just ain't showed up to be who they thought they was going to be. Yeah, That's all. But, you know, maybe it's a crop that's coming in now that's going to get me out of here. You never know. Mm, you're really could likes, be old news. Here. They like continuity. They like um, knowing what they're going to get. They like experience. This is my 10th year in EuroLeague, so, you know, I need to get out of here soon. <laughs> you going to leave I'm on top? You, you trying to leave on top, I, like, at your, at your I peak got to. form? Yeah. Yeah, I can't be weak. Yeah, I'm the same way, bro. I'm talking a little bit too much shit to be weak. <laughs> my okay. whole my whole demeanor can't be weak. If I'm weak, everybody just uh, it, it just don't it won't go real. I get booed. I, I you can't get booed if you're weak. They gonna stop booing me. <laughs> they gonna just start clapping like, "Oh, there go Mike." I remember when he was good. That ain't he good. tried his best. <laughs> he tried his best. Look at him. He, he's putting forth effort. Uh, man, <laughs> Maccabi fans is gonna be happy for me. They're gonna be happy to see me. Oh, Mike, remember when you was good? That was only last year. Nah, you, it was like seven years ago. That's when I'll know when I re when it's time to retire when. I can't talk about right now. I got to talk about years ago. Back in my day, ah, it's time. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> I'll be saying that about me dunking right now. I'll be like, yeah, back back then I used to be dunking. I don't do that no more. I got layups for you, though. Yeah, that's what I say about that dunks, too. No more. No more. But you got this. You can get this pull up and this step back. <laughs> it's about all I got at this point. Yeah, I hope you guys have many years left in your tank i hope you have a lot of space left for a big paychecks mm -hmm. for the upcoming years it's great to have you here in the european courts it's great to have you here on on their bonus podcast to hear your thoughts and the way you read the game and the whole situation so it was a pleasure to talk to you it was a pleasure having you both on the podcast thank you all for listening and watching well, thank you man i appreciate you. you having us on here and you know since we told you our goals and our ambitions what about you? You know, where, where do you see yourself going? Your bonus cop, a podcast? Man, you know, I, I didn't expect that. Coming to I the US. That was a good question. question. You know, what, what, what can the people expect from you? Okay, my initial dream was to make it to the NBA somewhere in the media, communications and stuff. But throughout the years, those dreams has changed a little bit. We, at, at least I'm trying to make one dream here in Europe to make the ESPN of Europe with basketnews.com. And also I got more interested in European basketball, front office stuff, you know, in, in the inner circle of how things are working, of how things can be done. Not sure if it goes with, you know, GM position, scouting or, or agents or stuff. I don't know yet, but... We'll see. I don't have this ultimate uh, goal because basketball is very, let's say, changing business. And it's always constantly provides some different new opportunities. But so far, I'm just enjoying this whole journey and getting this whole experience year by year. You should start the uh, first take debate show for Europe. I hate first take, really. <laughs> I hate first take. It's you. got great ratings. It's got great That's ratings. What I'm saying. People watch it. They'll watch That's you true. come debate. 
that's the worst part. That's the worst part. <laughs> my, America my loves drama. <laughs> yeah, my, my plan B is to have Eric, I mean, being retired and, get, and then getting a job in the ESPN or somewhere with his brother and hire me as an assistant, you know, to create some content ideas or something. So Come that's the through, worst man. case scenario. That's the worst All case right. scenario. That ain't a bad spot. That ain't a bad spot. Yeah. I'm going to be at home. <laughs> 